<laughs> well, good morning. It is wonderful to be back here again. Um, I do pray for Pastor David as he's not feeling well, um, but it's a privilege as always. So um, thank you for having me again. Uh, God is surely in this place as nobody knew that I was coming, including myself. And um, so Jerry didn't know the songs to sing. And the family of God, what a, what a wonderful song because my scripture goes uh, all along with family and the love that a family grows and has for each other. So that is surely a God thing, as no one, no one would have known those. Um, this morning, I, I wanted to start off briefly saying that the sermon I'm thinking, where I was thinking of speaking on is called Tune Up. Sometimes we all just need a tune up. When did I, where did I get that? Well, I, I know many of you, I've said it multiple times now, we have a lot of children. We have four, and they all drive. And they do not have great cars, they have teenage cars. So there's always a tune-up. There's always something that's wrong. Um, and so I eagerly wait for graduation and one more year, and then they can tune up their own cars. So, and as I was sitting there, I thought to myself, you know, our cars always need a tune-up. There's something that's always needing fixed. And how true is that not in our own spiritual lives? We need a tune-up sometimes, just a self-check. Um, so how do we go about knowing that? Well, let me explain this. My husband and I, I'm going to give you a small little synapse of our life. Growing up, and in, in, we grew up in the same church, and our parents knew each other, and I didn't like him. And he didn't like me. And um, I was a goody two-shoes, and he was bad. He just didn't listen, ever. He just, he was a good kid, but just didn't follow the rules. You know, he was the one that stepped on the line that you weren't allowed to cross. But he didn't cross it, really, because he was just stepping on it. Um, and now I have four of those. So, um, <laughs> But slowly, we grew up, and we started talking to each other, and, and, and he became more interesting to me, and till finally one day, he said, do you want to go be my girlfriend? I never thought, you know, so I thought, okay, I'll give it a test. I'll try to date this Howard, and um, <clears throat> so, you know, and we grew, and we, and we became to know each other more, and, and who we truly were, and not just what we oftentimes see on the surface, right, what, what people want you to perceive. Um, and we, we would struggle. You know, we were teenagers. We we're one of those high school romances, and uh, we we made it past high school. We 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 went into, I went into college. He went into the state patrol. We had a lot of ups and downs, a lot of tune-ups. And before I knew it, I thought I kind of really like this guy. You know, I don't want to admit it, but I kind of really do. And and at the time, Jerry, who is like another mother to me, would would give me piano lessons and. I confided in her a lot because no teenager confides in their mother, right? Because they don't know anything. So you find someone else who does. So, um, right, teenagers, we don't, our parents don't know much. Um, and I remember the day that Seth asked me to marry him. And we were at the Dairy Queen, and, which is where I worked. And it was on the sign, which I was not paying any attention to. And he's like, what does that sign say? And I said, huh? You know, because I had planned. I'm a type A personality. I had planned out what we were doing that day. And I didn't have time to look at that sign. And it said, Heather, would you marry me? For the whole town of Newton Falls to see. And so he parked the Dairy Queen. And all my coworkers were looking out that little glass window. The old Dairy Queen in Newton Falls. And he didn't put the car in park. And wham, we slammed into the stopper in front of us. Um, and everybody got to see that because he was nervous because we had been growing and building this relationship and actually truly learning who everyone we were. And there was a lot of setup and a lot of things. And so I couldn't wait to, to come find Jerry. And, and I found Jerry and I said, Jerry, Seth asked me to marry him. And she's like, what did you say? You know, are you going to? I'm like, do you want to think about it? Um, and I said, no, I, I think I really love him. Um, amidst all of his pruning that he's going to need. But, you know, I was a young, young lady, so I thought I was just going to change all this stuff about him and really make him, you know, I could look past that. So we grew. We, we got married, and, and obviously, and, we, and we, had a, we have a wonderful relationship. And there was a lot of growing, a lot of pruning in those first years, a lot of screaming. I'm not going to lie, I'm a screamer. Um, a lot of screaming, a lot of growth that took place, a lot of self-tune-up. Um, 
no children so we could have the nights where we would go out to eat and really work on our relationship and then I decided that we should have children and I said I think we should have kids and he said okay and so we had kids well then our time got pulled away and I thought the love that I had for my husband was the greatest love of all but then I looked at my son and I thought oh my goodness now I would really do anything for this you know I would do anything for this child of mine I would give up anything I don't care what I have I have my husband and I have my child and then we had more children three at one time and our love grew exponentially but there were things that I had to give up for that there were sacrifices that I made and our family started to grow along with that family came different personality types different you know my husband's a very flowy go with the flow everything's gonna be okay to the point that it's not gonna be okay honey you know it's not but and I'm the more type a we got to fix this we got to control everything and so we had four children and they have a, a lot of personality themselves um, my boys are very much like my husband most of them they go with the flow they're very lovey-dovey very huggy and my daughter is very independent um, she trumps my type A personality and she is a very organized structural don't get in her way kind of a girl matter of fact and she also has red hair I'm sorry if you do too but that just sets it for you she's a blessing but there's a lot of yeah there's a lot of tune-ups that go on in our family there's a lot of times when we have to say stop stop we're giving up too much of ourselves for other things let's come back together as a family let's check let's self-assess where are we at and then we had to self-assess our own marriage as our teenagers have grown they've taken a lot of time you know that from my husband and I we both work we both have a lot of things and so every once in a while we used to we'd say we're setting up a time and we're gonna go out to eat that same time every week and we tried and we tried but eventually that that falls through and we go back to our normal ways right what we knew before just the getting through life we self-assess but we are still in love and we still would do anything for each other so where is this going other than knowing my romantic life <laughs> well this is where it's going we love each other and I looked up the definition of love because in today's world people say love for everything I recently found out that I had celiac and that is a, a disease where or an immune disease where my body doesn't process gluten what's gluten good stuff like bread uh, pasta it's all the sticky stuff that holds it together my body doesn't do so well with that so my love for those foods had to change I love peanut butter and chocolate Reese cups Reese cups don't love me back but do we not say I love them right there's an a love emoji on all your Facebook things and all of that we love everything so what does love mean in today's world well today the definition of love is an intense feeling of affection an intense feeling of affection okay and to like or enjoy something very much I struggled when I read that to like or enjoy something very much because those are all human emotions that come that go that have limits that have stipulations that we can place on them it's 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 okay to love like that God's given us that emotion but when when we have to tune up or, or check up on those what happens in today's world most people just check out there's no tune-up I want to talk today about a different kind of love a love that is called agape agape is the different love it is the highest form of Christian love it's an action to show empathy it extends to the desire of all people to be good and beloved but it is a sacrificial love that's intended for everyone you see when my husband and I got married at the beginning when we were students I wouldn't have given anything for him I didn't want to give up like a night with my friends to go out with him right I, I didn't want to do that there was no relationship and there was no love but as we grew I gave up spending time with my friends I gave up doing other things because I wanted to get to know him more I wanted to be in the relationship with him more and then when my kids came up and grew up I gave up going to other things for our personal selves to attend their things 
because I loved them. When I go to a sporting event, even if it's far off, because some of those bleachers are real high, and I can tell which child is mine. If I can't see them, I can tell by what they walk like, their attitude, their actions on the court. I can tell when it's my husband, when we go to Myrtle Beach and he metal detects, which I know I've talked about here before. There are a lot of metal detectors in the morning, but I can pick my husband out. Because I love him, I would give up anything for him. We've grown in a relationship. There's a respect and there's an agape love there. I can choose him. So how does that affect us with scripture? So today's scripture, I want to talk about a person, which there are many throughout the scripture. We know that Jesus Christ gave his life for us on the cross. He's the picture of agape love. But the person I want to talk about today, I often find, and I hate to say the word character, because I, I feel like when you say the character in the scripture, it almost makes it fake. But the person that I want to speak of that I cannot wait to meet in heaven is Peter. He's a disciple who is after my own heart. I mean, he is full force passionate. We see him through the scripture. As soon as his brother tells him about Jesus, he leaves everything. Now, let's start with what is everything. <laughs> okay, so Peter lived in a basic life. He didn't have what I would call a formal earthly education. He was a fisherman by trade. He was normal, right? And he went out every day, and he brought home food to his wife. His wife loved him, I'm sure. He loved her. But there was so much love back then in those times that his mother-in-law got to live with them. He shared his love, right? That's a sacrificial love. I don't know about you. I love my mother-in-laws. I have two of them, but I don't want them to live with me. That's a lot of love and a lot of pruning, right? So they, he lived there. So, so Peter went out every day, but the love for his mother and his mother-in-law, he took care of them. This was his life. He was passionate. Jesus comes through and, and he says, I'm going to follow you. Jesus says, follow me. Give up your stuff at home and follow me. Now, he's the only breadwinner of this family. He's the only one that's bringing home food. So I think we take it lightly that he just left it all. He left his job, his stability, the income, the food that they were going to eat, his wife and his mother-in-law, to follow this man that he believed was the Messiah. He followed him everywhere. He learned and he became intimate in a relationship with him in his mind that he could not get just be, sit be sitting at home listening to stories of Jesus. He wanted a relationship to know God. So he followed Jesus everywhere. He learned from him. He became one of his, dare I say, top disciples, but John and Peter were often the two that followed him the most closely everywhere he went. Peter was passionate. Peter defended Jesus many times. He was that one that said, you can't do anything to my Jesus because I'm here. He defended him when he said, Jesus, you know, you're feeding all these people. You need to take a break. He was self-checking Jesus, just as my husband will self-check me sometimes and say, Heather, you're taking on way too much. You need to step back. Let me take care of this for you, which we do for loved ones. Peter loved Jesus. Peter loved Jesus so much that when they were in the garden, before Jesus willingly gave himself to be crucified for us, when the soldiers came, he was so angry because of his love for Jesus that he sliced off the soldier's ear. And it was a clean swipe, right? He, he took it off, and Jesus said, whoa, 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 whoa. Now, some people can say, what is Peter thinking? Jesus has never been mean, never been harsh, never been that kind of warrior type of love. It's been a different love the whole time. Peace, a patient love. But Peter just had that earthly love, that intense feeling of, of affection that he enjoyed being around Jesus so much that he felt the need to defend him. That's not wrong. That's just the earthly love, that makes us want to get mad. 
How many of you have children or, or, or a grandchild or just someone that you really liked? And when somebody starts to say something bad about them or go off, you kind of get this, wait a minute, you know? Now, I can clearly talk about my children, that's fine. But if someone else is going to go at them, the mama person comes out on you, right? Um, and so that's where Peter was. Why do we feel that way? Because we have that love. Because we put time and, and, and invested in this relationship. So Jesus says, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that, Peter. And he heals the ear. Then they go up and, and, and Jesus is talking to them saying, I'm going to pass away soon. The prophecy is going to be fulfilled. And someone's going to deny me. Well, Peter, right away. I'm not going to deny you. There's that type A personality coming back out again. Well, it isn't me. Because I gave up everything for you already. And here I am. And I love you. And I believe Peter loved Jesus. But yet, we see in the scripture that Peter does deny Jesus three times. Denies that he knows them for his own earthly protection. So that being said, Jesus is crucified. He raises, he rises from the dead, rose from the dead. Sorry, English people. He rose from the dead. And now he's on the earth for the next 40 days. He meets with the disciples two times. And then this third time is the one I want to get into. So we are in John chapter 21. In John chapter 21, we see here that that love and that following that Peter has done with his family, that Peter has done with Jesus, it is kind of settling down now. He doesn't specifically have a job anymore to follow Jesus and to preach about Jesus. So life's kind of gone back to that mundane. Well, what do I do now? What do I do now? Right now, my life and my husband's life is so busy. Our four children keep us going at all times, and I love it. People tell me all the time, oh, wait till you get the empty nest syndrome. You're going to be so sad. I don't see that yet. I'm on the other side. I don't know how you can be sad when you have some time to yourself. But maybe that will come, and then they say, you just don't know what to do with yourself. It's like starting all over again. You, you know, a lot of people will say, you fall back in love with your spouse differently. You, you know what I mean? I'm not there yet. I'm hoping we see that light, you know. But that's where I like to think that Peter and these disciples are. They've been in this relationship with Jesus for three years, knowing what to do, where to go, how to be guided, following all of it. And they love him. But now he's gone in the physical earthly form. And they're kind of, what do we do? What do I do? So it says in here, on chapter 21, I'm going to hit skip and go because I love this chapter, but it says, um, Simon Peter, in verse 2, and Nathan, and Nathaniel, and all of these disciples, they're working together, and they're kind of looking around, and they say, Simon Peter says, you know what? I'm going to go fishing. What better thing to do than go back to the roots that I've always done? Jesus came, it was a season in my life, and now I guess I'm supposed to go fish again and start providing for my family again. So he goes back to fishing, and everybody goes, and those disciples go with him. See, he, that type A personality again, he's leader. Disciples follow him. When they go out, uh, it says, when daybreak comes, in chapter 4, Jesus stood on the, store, on the shore, but the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Friends, Jesus called to them, you don't have any fish, do you? This conversation sounds very familiar, I'm assuming, to the disciples as it goes. Three years ago, we had the same conversation with some of these fishermen. It said, no, they answered. He says, cast your net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they did, and they were unable to haul it in because of the large number of fish. Chapter, or verse 7 says, the disciples, the one Jesus loved, that is speaking of John, he often refers to himself in this manner, he says to Peter, it is the Lord. It is the Lord. 
See, John had such a remarkable relationship with Jesus while his time was here on the earth. He said, I know that voice anywhere. I know him anywhere. I don't need to physically see him to know that that's the Lord. He also tells Peter, which I like to think, I know they weren't siblings, but I think they had that little battle kind of going on. Like, Peter, you mess up a lot. <laughs> like, you, you, you don't think before you do things. And I think John fought a little more out. That was that evened relationship. My husband thinks things out. I don't. I just want to do it. Once the, once the vision comes on and the passion comes on, I just want to go. And my husband's like, hold on. Let's see if we can do this. I just want to do it. Well, that's why I think Peter is so, stands out to me in the scripture because that's how I would be. So then it says, when, when Peter heard that it was the Lord, he tied his outer clothing around him and he jumps into the sea to swim to Jesus. He just jumps in. There's no waiting. There's no hesitation. Now, I remind you, the last time he probably, well, he saw Jesus twice, but the last time he really engaged with Jesus, he had denied him. Can you imagine that burden when you hurt someone or you offend someone and, 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 you, and you just want to apologize, right? You just want to say, I'm so sorry for hurting you. In my marriage, there's been apologies. It's part of growing. It's part of tuning up. Peter jumps in this water. But what's so funny to me is it says, the other disciples came in the boat because it wasn't that far out. They say, we're going to get there. Hold on, Peter. No. Peter had an intense love that he said, I've got to get to Jesus now. I don't care about this boat. I don't care about anything else. So they bring it in and they see a fire and, and, and Jesus is cooking the fire. And, and he says, you know, come over here. Come sit with me. And, and, and they had collected so many fish again. But the part that I want to dive into is over here in chapter 13, or chapter, 15, tw chapter 21, verse 15. I apologize. Jesus and Peter sit down and have a little powwow. They have a talk that I think by far has stood out to me in Scripture as something that has always touched my heart. This is my tune-up conversation that I feel like I have with Jesus. He says to him, when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Immediately, Simon he answers, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Okay. Yes, Lord, you know I love you. I say to my husband, yes, Seth, I love you. What? You know, do you love me? Yes, what? What do you need? What do you want? Right? We kind of jump back at things and say, oh, I love you, honey. I tell my kids, I love you. Be careful. Be safe. I don't want to say it's not a love. It is. It's a supernatural answer. It's a, it's a not supernatural, superficial answer that we just kind of splurt out. Right? It just, we just say it. And Peter said that, Lord, you know I love you. He's probably thinking in his mind, I just swam to you. I just swam to you. Jesus said, I did three years with you. I'm so sorry. I apologize. But it continues. He says, yes, Lord, I know you love me. And Jesus says, then feed my lambs. Jesus has given him some direction. Okay, so now I need you to feed my lambs. I need you to take care of something for me. And then he says a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Simon Peter says, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. When my children and I say their name, hey, Kennedy, come here, please, she listens. When I say, Kennedy, Elizabeth, hmm, her ears perk up a little more. Why are you asking her? Why are you saying it twice? Right? So I'd like to think that, that, that Peter's starting to put a little thought into this. Do you love me? Yes, I love you, Lord. He said, shepherd my sheep. You've got to direct them. You've got to do something with that. We have to have an action. And then a third time, he says, Simon, son of John, and these scripture will be different for different versions, but it says, do you agape me? 
In all the translations, <clears throat> love is just the basic word that they've taken the Hebrew language and turned it to. But there were different levels of that love. There are different ways to say it. Just like we say, I like, I love. They're different. So were these three loves. And the third time, Peter answers differently, and he says that he was grieved. And he says, Lord, you know everything. You know everything. So you know that I love you. So now his thoughts process is changing. Do you agape me? He said, feed my sheep. He gives him the job to go out and feed my sheep. This was Peter's tune-up. How does that tune-up affect us? What I'd like to do is go back through this, and I want you to place your name there. Instead of Peter, I, I'm not going to say everybody's names. I'm going to say my own, but I'd like for you to say your own name. How do I get tune up from this chapter? This is how I get it. If I finally sit down and take a break and I look at my relationship that I've built with Jesus, the relationship that we, shrug, that we try for, I like to sit down and think to myself, if he said, Heather, do you love me? Initially, I'm going to say, yeah. Lord, I love you. I love you because I attend church. I raise my children in church. You've been there for me, good and bad. You love me because we've, as they read this scripture earlier, we've all sinned, and yet you still love me? I love you, Lord. I'm raising my children to, to, to love you. I'm, I'm, I, my husband and I do these things. We love you. And God would say, okay, thank you. Those are all, those are all feelings and emotions that you're doing. That's great. Those are some actions. Those are nice. But then when he says, Heather, do you love me more than these? I start to think, Heather, do I love God enough, a walk, enough to walk away from my job if I needed to, if God called me for that? Enough to walk away from my financial stability? Enough, it says in Scripture, to walk away from your family if they choose something different than you choose? To walk away from the gossip, to walk away from the things of this world that are not right. Do I love you to do that? Those are all earthly things, but then that last one gets me. Because you see, Jesus wasn't asking about the earthly love anymore. He wasn't asking Peter, hey, do you love me enough? We know. He stepped away from his family. He stepped away from friends. He stepped away from his job, which we all do, right? We've all done that. We take that leap of faith. We're sitting here today, right? We're not like the world. They're, they're not at church maybe today. We're here. But that third one, can you ask yourself? If Jesus says to you, which he does the third time, Heather, do you agape me? Do you love me at the highest Christian love? Do you sacrifice your whole you? The whole Heather, the whole whatever, fill in your name. Do you sacrifice your family and your job and you trust me enough to care for all of that? Is your relationship there? Because that's what God wanted. That's what Jesus requires. That's what Peter now understood. Yeah, Jesus, you know everything. You do know everything, God. God knows everything about you. And yet the whole kicker to me when I read this was, why is Jesus asking Peter, do you love me? Jesus had done no wrong. He was blameless. He was perfect. Why was Peter not crying? God, do you still love me? God, do, even though I failed you, even though I denied you, even though I'm not right, even though I went right back and didn't know what to do, do you still love me? It wasn't Peter asking that. Because Peter knew agape love. Peter knew 
that Jesus was different than everyone else. He knew that God was different. His love ex extended across. There was no breaks. There were no wrongs. There was no impurities. Think of that. Jesus died for you and I. And yet he's still the one that's asking Peter, do you love me? Because I've got a job for you. And I believe that that day, Peter changed his thoughts about everything. In the scripture when it says, do not be conformed to the ways of this world. Don't be worried about the things that go on in this world. Separate yourself. You'll find a peace. You'll find an understanding that the world doesn't have. Peter found that. But you have to be honest with your tune-up. Yeah, we come to church. Yes, we do a lot of activities. Yes, we belong to Bible studies. Yes, we study. Has that become a routine? And can you answer Jesus? Yes, Jesus, I agape you. I don't just love you because of the things that you've done for me. I don't just love you because it's morally seems correct and is better than the way the world lives. But I love you with an agape love. That means you have my all. You have everything. This chapter, as we finish up here, says, Jesus says to him, he says, good, because you're going to die a painful death for me. You're no longer going to be in control of what you wear, what you do, how you, how you go about your day. You're going to die for me because you love me. And he says, okay. He said, now follow me. And Peter chooses that that day. Peter chooses to follow him that day in a way that I believe changed everything. And he goes on, and we know the day of Pentecost, and Peter preaches and changes 3,000. But that wouldn't have happened if he thought he just loved Jesus. So today, church, I ask you, as we close, and as Jerry brings us to a close, do you agape Jesus? Maybe you need a tune-up. Maybe you love him, and you know that you love him, but deep down inside... You're not really ready to give up everything. Not really ready to go through that tune-up phase where it's uncomfortable sometimes and, and we need to adjust. Could you today, if Jesus sat beside you and said, follow me, get up and go? Think about that.